The reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 15, beginning from verse 29 to 16, 4. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up into the mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people, for they have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up the seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were 4,000, besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus to test him by asking him how to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning... Today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left and went away. Let's see if this... Oh, that's coming through, isn't it? Great. Uh, Well, hi there. Um, My name's Lachlan, and I'm one of the team from Moore College. Uh, I I know I met some of you last week. I I know there are a bunch who I didn't meet as well, but it's nice to see you all here. Um, And I know there are uh, many guests who have been invited today too. Uh, Well, I just want to say also thank you to this church for hosting us this week. It's been a real pleasure to see how this week Uh, your church has reached out into the community and welcomed people. Welcomed people in to hear of God's love and experience it. And I'm really excited now to take a moment to preach on what we've just heard. If you're new, perhaps this is a little strange to you. We've just heard a reading from the Bible, and now we spend some time processing what we've heard from God. We do this because in the Bible, God is speaking to us. And God's word is not merely myths to teach morals. It's his work that has enduring significance for all people. Uh, What I'll be speaking about today is especially significant for those of us who are new today. Uh, Now, before we get back into what we've just read, I want us to remember something we all know. We are breathing right now, but one day that will stop. Our life is a gift but we are fragile. Regardless of how well we look after ourselves, we don't know how long we have. Sometimes illness and injury suddenly take us by surprise. Sometimes death looms for a while, and there's no escaping it. My grandfather was quite unwell for some time, and I'll be at his funeral on Tuesday. It's a reminder that death looms. Uh, But we keep eating and drinking and breathing, often mindless of our own mortality, especially when everything is so convenient. Just at the the click of a finger, you can have anything you want. Uh, 
But uh, we just heard a story from Matthew's account of Jesus about thousands of people who followed him into a remote place. And they stayed there three days without food. They weren't survival experts, they were average folk, uh, with access to food and water and support back in their towns. So what were they thinking? Well, I hope that by listening closely to their story, we might see what Jesus did, we might understand who he is, and we might realize the decision before us. God is saying to us that Jesus gives life to all who come to him. Now, I have a little clicker here. Let's see if that will work. Ah, there we go. Oh, good. So that's it's just the text that was read before uh, for you to look at if you, if you would like to. Well, this event, uh, the, the first aspect I want to focus on is that Jesus restores life. Jesus restores life. So this event is in the middle of Matthew's account of Jesus. Uh, Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He was there at the scene. And up to this point, Jesus had been teaching and healing many people all throughout Israel, and then in the other nations to the north of Israel, and now as he comes back down along the Sea of Galilee, huge crowds flock to him. He was an international superstar. Uh, I know Taylor Swift was recently out here in Sydney, or in Australia, uh, and thousands upon thousands of people flocked to see her sing and to sing along with her. Uh, but what we have here is a, a totally different kind of experience. These crowds were not fans of his sayings. These crowds had family and friends who were desperately sick with all kinds of disabilities. Some couldn't walk, and they needed to be carried out into this remote place. Some couldn't see. They needed to be led by the hand out to be with Jesus. It's a strange picture, isn't it? <laughs> uh, leaving behind food and physicians they take the sick out into the desert. But word has spread all around that anyone who comes to Jesus is healed. Though it sounds impossible, they were persuaded that he is the real deal. So they brought them to Jesus. They laid them at his feet. And the resolution is so straightforward, but so significant. He healed them. Uh, huge crowds of people with disabilities of, in, of all kinds, incurable kinds of disabilities. Uh, no one has ever healed like this before. Not before this, not since. Uh, many wonderful charities send out teams of specialists to treat specific treatable conditions. Uh, and thank God, they do a great job. But something about Jesus means that he is able to restore life to all all who come to him, however deep or different their issue. And when Jesus heals them, who do they thank? It says that they praised the God of Israel because they recognized that Jesus is not just a special healer, but that he is God with us. Jesus' birth and his character and his words and his miracles, they all make the claim that he is God with us. The crowd, they recognized who he was, and they came to him for healing, and they praised God when he gave it. Jesus, God with us, restores life. Uh, I've heard some stories this week of people in desperate illness coming to Jesus in prayer and asking for healing and wonderfully, miraculously receiving it. Jesus is able to do that. But as we read on, it also becomes clear that Jesus is not just a healer. He offers so much more, so much more. Uh, so the second aspect I want to speak about is of Jesus' ability to give, give life is that he sustains life. Now, when they were healed, you notice that they didn't just go home, back to the town. They've got their life back. Are they expecting something more? Why are they still hanging out in this remote place? Uh, well, Jesus looks on them and he calls his disciples and he says, I have compassion for these people. Compassion. I'm sure we've all experienced the feeling. Have you walked past someone kneeling on the ground, begging for money for, to pay for food or shelter? 
My heart is provoked by compassion to want to help. And sometimes I feel like giving money is the right thing to do. Other times I wonder if it will only make matters worse. But every time I'm reminded that despite my compassion, I can't really fix the deep problem. I can't give them lasting stability. So isn't it really good here that Jesus, God, who is fully able to address their need, looks on the needy with compassion? Uh, and in this particular event, uh, what they need physically at that moment is food. They've been staying out in the middle of nowhere for three days with nothing to eat. Why haven't they gone home? What are they thinking? Well, maybe they've heard of what happened just a couple of chapters ago in Matthew's Gospel, uh, back in chapter 14, where Jesus fed an even larger crowd with about the same amount of food that they had on them. Now, uh, funnily enough, Jesus' disciples had seen that same miracle with their own eyes. But it seems like they hadn't understood it yet because they asked, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Uh, it's a bit like when you're holding your keys and asking, well, where are my keys? Where are my keys? You know, glasses on your head. Where are my glasses? Uh, the disciples have forgotten the power of the one that they are with. Now, just like last time Jesus fed the crowd, he gathers up a few loaves, uh, broke them up and the fish too, and gave them out to distribute among the people. And once again, the resolution is so straightforward, the impossible is done with ease. Now, listen again to the way that Matthew stresses some of these details to make sure he's clear what happened that day. They all ate. Uh, well, Surely they must have just had a little crouton with a little flake of fish on top, right? Uh, no, all were satisfied. Oh, well, it, it must have been a pretty small crowd then. Uh, no, 4,000 men besides women and children. So more like 10,000 people out there. Well, it, it must have been just enough food, barely enough. Uh, no, Matthew said, they picked up seven basketfuls of leftovers. That's, that's more than they started with, right? Uh, last night, Wenty Anglican hosted a dinner for around 70 people. Uh, it was lovely. The people who provided food worked really hard in advance to prepare delicious curries. Uh, it was really generous of them. And everyone who came was really thankful for their service. But, but this is a different ball game, isn't it? Uh, Jesus fills 10,000 people with food, with barely any to start with, and no preparation, and there was more left over than he had to begin with. What does all this mean? And what good is this for us? We weren't there. Uh, this miracle of feeding thousands is not just meant to leave us salivating for some fresh bread and nice grilled fish. Jesus did this so that we might understand who he is. He doesn't just heal the sick. He offers life and he's able to give it. He doesn't just feed the hungry. He offers life. He's able to give it. John's Gospel records Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Jesus wants us to see that he sustains life so we can come to him for it. I just realized I've got the second half up there. Uh, and I've heard some stories this week about people coming to Jesus in prayer, asking for provision and protection, sustaining of life, and with great answers to prayer, miraculous results. But as we read on, we'll see that what Jesus offers is not just healing, and it's not just sustenance of life. He offers something so much greater. Uh, so the third aspect of Jesus' life-giving ability is that he guarantees life. Uh, so Matthew records the aftermath of these events, these, miracle, these miracles, which deal with the people's responses. The Pharisees and Sadducees, that is, the educated religious people, they come to Jesus and they tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. They know that he's been doing impossible miracles. They've seen it. They saw him heal a paralyzed man. They saw him heal a man with a disfigured hand. They saw him heal a man who was born blind and mute. And now they hear that he's been feeding crowds in the desert. 
That's something only God can do, and they know it. Uh, so what do they do? Well, they, they don't come to Jesus for life, but they test him by demanding another sign. It's not the first time they've done this. After witnessing other miracles, they asked for more signs too a few chapters ago. They've seen the signs, but they refuse to believe. Uh, you know the saying, seeing is believing, or uh, picks or it didn't happen? These sayings suggest that if we just saw it with our eyes, then we'd believe it. But that's, that's often not how it works, is it? Remember, the disciples saw Jesus feed the 5,000, uh, but then when they were with the 4,000, they still had no idea where they could get enough food. I think, in fact, it often works the other way around. Believing is seeing. The crowds knew enough about Jesus to know and to trust that he would restore life and sustain their life in this remote place. And he did. Now, the Pharisees and Sadducees knew full well what Jesus was claiming, and they'd seen signs, many of them, but they refused to believe it. They shut their eyes. Uh, Jesus says to them, you know how to read the weather forecast and how to act accordingly, but when it comes to me, you've shut your eyes. And this attitude, shutting their eyes, denying God, Jesus calls it wicked. So he says that no more signs will be shown to them. But he does still promise one big sign, the sign of Jonah. And the last time they demanded more signs, he said the same thing, the sign of Jonah. Now, if Jesus said it twice, two different occasions, it must be significant. Uh, but what does it mean? Well, the Pharisees, the Pharisees knew what happened to the prophet Jonah. He was swallowed by a huge fish, maybe some of you know the story, swallowed by a huge fish and was spat out on land on the third day. And Jesus said, the last time he explained this, that just like Jonah was inside a fish for three days, he will be in the earth for three days. And then he's out. Three days and he's out. Jesus is claiming that he'll die and rise. Now, Jesus has been feeding the sick, uh, sorry, feeding the hungry and healing the sick. Wouldn't it be better to keep doing that? Isn't that good work? Uh, why would he plan to die? Well, it's because we, we all face a far deeper problem than just sickness and hunger. We all live through the frustration of, of tiring work and, and sickness and hunger and the knowledge that we'll die. And life is like this because there's a deeper issue at play. The deeper issue is we've all run from God, fleed him and shut our eyes. Uh, we've run from the God who lovingly gave us breath and who sustains our every breath. This denial of God's goodness was what the Bible calls sin. We're all sinners, and without God's help, we are trapped in it. It's the reason our world is full of corruption, full of illness, frustration, and death. Uh, left to ourselves, we are simply hopeless, spiraling towards death with no hope of life with God because of our uh, rejection of him. But he still has compassion on us, just like Jesus did for those crowds. God has compassion on us. He sent his son to be with us, Jesus, and to take on death for us. As we, read, as we read on in Matthew, as Jesus approaches his death, he says this, that the reason that he came was to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, what Jesus calls the sign of Jonah is about him stepping into death to bear the cost of our sin. Uh, and more than that, it's about him rising from the dead. And now Jesus, Jesus in the flesh, stands on the other side of death calling us to come to him for life. It's not just a kind of happier life now. This is full assurance of real life after death, just as Jesus has. And the, ch the people at this church, they really believe it. Uh, see this new life sign? It was up at Easter because the people of this church really believe that Jesus rose in the flesh and now stands on the other side of death, 
calling people to life, to come to him for the guarantee of life. These people are like the crowds flocking to the, flocking to the wilderness to meet Jesus in the desert, to have their lives restored by his mercy and sustained by his power and guaranteed by his resurrection. Now, what we've been speaking about today is not a secret. It's the hope of all humanity since the beginning. It's what God has promised through the prophets. And it's what Jesus proclaimed with words and signs. It's the news that Christians have been preaching for 2,000 years. It's the reason this church exists. It's the reason they send people all over the world. You can see a little map of the world over there. This church is sending people all over the world to share this news. And it's the reason that you've been invited here today. God loves you. He has compassion on you. Uh, Though you are stuck in sin, he has compassion on you. He sent his son to be with us. Jesus healed the sick to show that he restores life. He fed the hungry to show that he sustains life. And he died and rose to guarantee your life. Please don't be like the Pharisees who shut their eyes. Keep your eyes open. Look at Jesus who gives life and come to him. If you have further questions, whatever they are, please ask someone. You can ask me after the service, ask anyone who brought you along. Uh, And if you have been listening today to God's word and you feel Jesus calling you to come to him for life, I invite you to do that with a prayer. He is alive and full of compassion and he encourages us to pray. Uh, So here is a a prayer that I will pray. Hmm. Uh, And this is essentially what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't have to be these exact words, uh, but this is essentially what every Christian has prayed. If you feel that this is true for you, please pray to God quietly in your mind. He knows our every thought. Uh, I invite you to pray along with me, if that's you. Let's pray. Dear God, I'm sorry for running away from you and and now I'm sick with sin that I can't cure. Thank you for showing compassion to me by sending your son to die that I might live again. Please restore my life from this sickness as I trust your son Jesus to raise me from death. Amen. If you have prayed this prayer with me just then, uh, please come tell me about it after the service or speak to the person you came with. Or if you have questions, further questions, that's wonderful. Please keep asking them. Uh, We, I and this church, hope that you keep looking to Jesus and coming toward him. Thank you.